Hey guys, happy Easter. Welcome to TCRS in Big Sky, Montana. I did really want to go live when I was in New York. I just had a few sort of unexpected technical issues. Uh, today we're going to just go through a couple of, uh, you know, updates uh, in terms of the Stephen Smith case. Uh, we know that his body was quietly exhumed. Second autopsy performed, uh, he's been interred uh, once again. And so what, what has been the result of that? What, what, um, what, uh, what has been, what, 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 what have we learned? What, what has come out of that whole process? So we're going to be looking at that aspect. Uh, Chacha, good to see you. And then um, we're also going to... Quickly go into the the uh, Idaho case. There's been a couple of developments there. Um, you don't hear too much of um, Ethan Chapin, but there's quite a heartwarming story. His parents have broken their silence. They've, I think, they plant tulips or something, and they've they've named a, a particular flower off to their son, and they've spoken a little bit about him. So we're going to look at that, talk a little bit about that, and then. Also, the ID that was found, uh, who did it likely belong to and what does it all mean kind of thing. And then um, also quite interesting, the grandfather of J.J. Ryan in the Lori Vallow case isn't going to be allowed to attend trial. What is that all about? So I want to get into this. Uh, I haven't had breakfast and it is uh, almost eight o'clock in Montana, uh, very cold, but also very beautiful. Uh, by the way, if you're interested in following my journey, head to uh, my Instagram. You can see uh, some of the pictures that I put up of um, Yellowstone. Uh, Lisa and I were in Yellowstone yesterday. So go and check that out. I also put a couple of other photos on um, Van Gogh Letters on the Team Peachtree channel. So um, you can also go and have a look at that. So let's start off with the second autopsy in the Stephen Smith case. And I've asked you guys to vote in the poll. Um, uh, Bridget, good to see you back here again. Hamilton, good to see you as well. Kevin, yo, good to see you. I hope you guys are having a good Easter and are going to have a good Easter weekend. So according to the oh. poll, According to the poll, 8% uh, say the autopsy hasn't changed anything. 70% uh, say it's too, so it has changed things, but it's hard to say exactly what. And then 22% say, well, it's hard to say either way. So we'll see how those numbers change. I'll come back to that poll a little bit later on. So let's have a look at this article from Greenville News. And it. I really just want to read the first paragraph or so. Um, it refers to says the details are slowly emerging. And then here's what we know. It just basically says that, uh, that we are still waiting. Can you see that? Uh, we are still waiting for official results from the that second autopsy, right? And obviously, it's an autopsy uh, eight years later. Right, um, and the important part I think to highlight here is it was originally ruled a vehicular hit and run. Right, that that was how it was originally ruled, and um, so is that going to change? And I, and I would presume if you guys say the second autopsy has changed something. Uh, if 70% of you, 75% are voted yes, do you think that also means that it's going to change this assessment that, um, you know, if it was originally ruled a vehicular hit and run, then what are we dealing with now? Are we, are we going to have a different cause or manner of death, right? What do you guys think? What do you guys say? Joanne says it's three. Is it three p.m. in the UK? I presume. 
Happy Easter. Hope you're having a good day there. Parker, Marie Parker says it's almost 10 a.m. I guess you must be sort of in New York, 2 a.m. in New Zealand. Okay. Some of you up all over the world. Okay. Right. So what Marie said, I think the autopsy will change the outcome. Okay. So one area in which the autopsy, I think, adds to what we already knew or what SLED already knew or what investigators already knew is the fact that they x-rayed Stephen's skull, right? Do you agree with that? Um, the the, the x-ray of his skull would basically show very clearly, almost in a three-dimensional way, the damage caused by the trauma to to you know the cranial bones right and so that is going to give us a better sense of people have been talking about blunt force trauma people have been talking about you know was he struck by a bat was he struck by a vehicle was he struck by a signpost was he struck by um a vehicle right my personal opinion is that the x-ray First of all, I don't know for, for a fact that they didn't perform an X-ray to begin with. Something tells me that they didn't. So I think the X-ray is going to shed additional light on what we know. It's going to give us a better idea of the kind of object that caused the trauma. My personal opinion, without looking at any of the information, and it's not available yet, but my personal opinion is that we're going to see sharp force trauma. We're going to see some kind of sharp, um, uh, sh when I say sharp, I don't necessarily mean the point of a knife. It might just be um, a pointed, it could even be a pointed metal object. I think that's what we're going to see, something like that. Um, let's see what you guys are saying. Uh, Special K, good to see you here. Kathy, good morning. Right, so that's the first thing I really want to deal with is that I think the X-ray is going to provide greater clarity. I personally suspect we're going to see something like sharp force trauma. Bear in mind, in the previous autopsy, which the second autopsy actually confirmed that the first autopsy was actually done to a really high standard. So you haven't really heard heard from the second autopsy that that it rubbishes the first one or that 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 it, the first one was unprofessional or incomplete or whatever it was. Um, I think you could say that the second one is going to provide additional information. The question is, is it going to contradict anything? Is there going to be anything different? Uh, Cassandra says, could it be a hammer, right? Uh, Bridget says, I think so too. Anne says, I see a car passenger whacking with a baseball bat. Okay, well, again, can you have a injury that that resembles a bullet wound in a case like that and a bullet wound it wasn't a bullet wound right um but a bullet wound would appear similar in a sense to sharp force trauma a small directed area of pressure right so i i think what is already fairly clear is that it wasn't blunt force trauma and it wasn't very likely wasn't from a baseball bat. I know what many people are thinking and suspecting. Baseball bat, Buster, Buster murdered Stephen Smith with a baseball bat. That is what uh, a lot of people are speculating about, but the evidence doesn't seem to support that. Um, but we'll see. Who knows? Maybe, um, you know, they've, they've found paint flakes. Who knows if they're going to find the sort of fragments or whatever that is associated with somebody else. They were also looking for DNA. Um, I think that that is, you know, when you think about contaminated crime scenes, someone has been embalmed, um, you know, the whole uh, DNA situation is uh, definitely much trickier than, than, you know, in a situation where you've got a covered up crime scene kind of thing, you know or even a stage crime scene. Uh, Seashore Girl, uh, thanks a lot for that from New Jersey. I was in your neck of the woods a couple of days ago. 
Hamilton says it is cost, but they must be looking for something. Thanks a lot, Kate. So let's go into the uh, next aspect. Um, if there's anything else I wanted to highlight here. You see, it says here, uh, let's bring this up. At this point, they're considering the possibility of a murder investigation. It's not necessarily that. It says that SLED confirmed to the Smith family that it was officially considering um, the case a murder investigation. So uh, I'm not sure if I agree with that term terminology. I think they, they, they're viewing it as a homicide investigation. And I mean, it would be either way if it was a hit and run or um, intentional murder. If it is intentional murder, what is the motive? Okay. Anyway, let's go to um, this article from Fox News. By the way, um, there were sort of different opinions about was it disrespectful to photograph the grave when it when it was open, and I think the family and the lawyers asked that it not be done, and I think Fitz News did actually photograph, and and I don't know. To me, it's reality. Um, I, I can understand um, someone else saying it's private. I can understand that. But I also think just from a human perspective, you know, it, it brings to light the reality that what's going to happen to all of us, we're all going to be buried. We all going to have a grave somewhere unless we, you know, choose a different means of burial. But, um, and, and it, it basically reminds us of how sad this is. We, we had this, the, you know, uh, Stephen Smith died about eight years ago and, that's his grave, and that's where he was in the grave. And, um, you know, I think sometimes we don't want to think about sensitive things. And the countries, uh, you know, I lived in South Korea where people actually, it's going to sound uh, strange if you've never heard this before, but in South Korea, they have a belief system, some people do, where they, at a certain time of the year, they actually exhume the the remains of the of, a, of family members right literally the, the bones and then they wash them they, they treat them with certain not sure what it is um but they basically handle the bones they wash them and so on and it's a way that they remember and honor their relatives and you might say cheap as that is crazy or it's strange or whatever but to them it's not to them it's normal to them it's a way of maintaining a kind of physical contact, but also beyond that, with it's a way of paying respect to not only the dead but to a particular person. And um, you know, on the one hand, you might say, um, you know, I would never do that or whatever. But think about the the amount of investment that that requires um, emotionally. You know, um, it, uh, it, it happens at a certain time of year, every year. And it's not just one family, obviously, that does it. A lot of people do it. Um, and it um, it's a way that they pay respect and remember their, their previous family members. And I don't know, I find, them, find it quite um, touching that, that someone would go to that kind of effort. It also kind of makes me think a bit of Jeffrey Dahmer, who, who kind of also kept bones and skulls and so on. And even though it's like there's no skin covering, seem to recognize the person in in those bones, right? Bridget says, I don't have an issue with it so long as it's respectful. Uh, Stephanie Hooper, good to see you. Happy Easter, Kate, good to see you. Okay, so. Anyway, I'm just saying that I can kind of understand how the family felt, but I actually felt also when I saw those images, I felt quite touched by it. So anyway, what we want to think about now is the 
you know, what, what is the result of the actual autopsy? Have we really learned anything? So there's quite an interesting article here in uh, Fox News, and, and yes, yes, kind of a bottom line. Um, Buster Murdoch isn't believed to be connected to Smith, South Carolina death, despite long-standing rumors. So we don't have a situation here where um, Stephen's body's been exhumed and now there's an arrest warrant for Buster. Definitely not happening right now. In other words, if anything, the investigation into Stephen Smith, certainly at the moment, doesn't seem to be taking us towards Buster murder as a perpetrator. Do you guys agree with that or do you think it's too early to say or you convinced that it's got to be Buster. Like, what, what do you guys, um, yeah, make me ghost face for you. Says, I'll read more about that. You should check it out. Lani says, I'm in Western Wyoming. You've arrived at the perfect time. This week is the first spring like weather we've, we, we'll have. Well, I believe I brought this good weather because there was also good weather in New York and there was a big storm the day before I arrived. And of course, when I say I brought good weather, you know, I, I'm from, South Africa, where it's late summer and it was warm when I left, and apparently I am bringing warmer weather. Uh, Sokolin says, I'm not up to date. What is the autopsy revealed? Well, they haven't really released uh, much of it, but let's have a look at what uh, it says in this article. Let's check it out. Okay. What does James Curtis say? James says, Koberger went to kill one person and killed the others because they heard him. Um, let me ask you a question, James. We're going to get to Koberger in a moment. Um, why not, if that person's walking on their own somewhere or returning from class or whatever, uh, why not do it that way? Right? It's a little bit like you intending to kill someone who's in a football stadium. I'm, I'm exaggerating. Uh, but, you know, why, you know, like if you think about all the other murders we've dealt with, people tend to target someone and then they kill them when they're alone. Why wouldn't you do that in this instance? Or even just when, that, when it was just Maddie and Kaylee together. Remember when they were... Um, walking from the corner club, they were basically just the two of them. Why would you complicate things? I'm just just uh, asking you to think about that aspect. Kate said, I'm not sure about Buster. Uh, Sarah said, too early to say. Okay. What is that comment about Wyoming? Oh, by the way, I might be returning to Yellowstone when it's a bit warmer to see the southern part because that's not that part's not open yet. <laughs> so I might be back to Wyoming. Um, Adrian says news just released: Stephen was not killed by a vehicle. Uh, let's let's check that. Let's have a look. Uh, so what I'm seeing here is um, crime scene reconstructionist. There's, there are four or five things that may have happened to him, which we're going to deal with. That's this article over here, right? We're going to deal with that. With that. Um, uh, Stephen Smith, new evidence found, exhumation of success. Uh, the state says, yes, this is four hours ago. Here's what we know about the first autopsy. Um, yeah, so um, that's that's really interesting news. You've got um, Adrian. Uh, what's your source for that? What's your source for that? I see autopsy said to. Yield new evidence. Okay, that's from him, Dan Abrams. Um, so I, I don't, I don't see anything about the vehicle thing being excluded. 
I know people seem to want to believe that the vehicle's excluded. Uh, Sokolin says, I've wondered if it would actually Paul Murdoch. He had a temper. We do know that the Murdochs have got a lot of secrets, right? But what possible problem could Paul have had with Stephen? He was two years younger. Uh, bear in mind, it's eight years ago. So how old would Paul have been eight years ago? No, like literally, how old was Paul eight years ago? Wouldn't he have been like 14 years old? Maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit older, maybe 16. Wolfie, good to see you, says, I voted. It's hard to say because I haven't heard about or read the autopsy yet. Okay, so let's go through this article. <laughs> and that just refers to <clears throat> some of the um, uh, results of the uh, from the pathologist. And they basically say uh, they've determined the cause and the manner of death, right? <clears throat> They've determined the cause and manner of death. We just don't know what those actually are. So it says here, the pathologist who oversaw the autopsy um, have now, uh, you know, revealed, shall I make this a bit bigger, have revealed the cause and manner of death within their report, but not to us. Uh, Dr. Michelle Dupree, a forensic pathologist, um, and former law enforcement officer told Law and Crown that Smith's casket was removed from a vault at the Gooding Cemetery in South Carolina and driven to a private lab in Tampa, Florida. I think I read that there are three private labs there. Forensic pathologist Dan Schultz and anthropologist Heather Walsh-Haney performed the second autopsy. So it seems like you had two experts on hand, you know, which is better than one. Um, having a look at at these bones, and yeah, so there's an actual view of the of the grave. I think it was taken by Fitz News. Some people were offended by that. Um, I, I, I'm not I'm not sure I find it offensive, but maybe it's not my place to say that. Um, and then that's really it. There's not really much more in this article about all of that. So let's go on to um, People magazine, uh, People, and then it refers to uh, crime scene reconstructionist says there are four or five things that may have happened to, to the team. Now, if you guys have followed my coverage of this case of Stephen Smith, I've kind of done... Uh, crime scene reconstruction, because I mean, I do it in, I've written lots of books and I reconstruct um, and reimagine and re-dramatize and, and, you know, um, re, uh, what do you call it? Um, kind of, in some cases, you try and reanimate, such as in Oscar Pistorius' case, you try to, um, yeah, reconstruct what likely happened here. And so I, I've done that by looking at his the injuries that he had and by looking at a particular uh, set of scenarios. And um, and I've I've come up with a with a theory and, and I've I have said this is the way you're gonna solve this case. I think the X-rays are gonna help you, but the other the other one is uh, a crime scene reconstruction is gonna tell you was he struck, right? Um, and then how was he struck, where was he struck, and then what happened after he was struck. So it's kind of reverse engineering the position he was found in to the position where he, he was likely struck. Um, I was driving with Lisa um, from Bozeman to to Big Sky, and so you, you, you're seeing trucks on the road all the time, you're seeing vehicles on the road all the time, and you're noticing that some, some vehicles have things sticking out of them. Um, we saw trucks with winches behind them. Sometimes the, the winches are sort of swinging like that, um, but, but you sometimes see big trucks with equipment and trailers that are 
especially in sort of farm rural settings like like where we are here in Montana. Um, but the point is that the crime scene reconstruction can basically reverse engineer everything. And I honestly think that 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 is going to settle what happened. I, I honestly think that is is going to do that. Um, you know, people say, and this was Lisa's argument to me was she said, why was Stephen found in the middle of the road? And I said, he wasn't actually found in the middle of the road. He was found close to the middle of the road, but more on one side. Also, um, I don't think it necessarily means the way he was found. Um, you know, it's not quite as simple as he was struck and he, and he just dropped down there. In other words, he was in the middle of the road, he was hit, and then he was found in the middle of the road. He could have been on the side of the road, struck, and his body actually spun to some extent. He could have hit on the side or whatever. Um, he may have even been running to avoid a, a vehicle overtaking another one, maybe if he was on the road. But he could have been struck. I've fallen on my bike many times, and you, not actually many times, but a couple of times, and you you can spin. You, you can if you hit the, the road at a speed, you can actually spin in different directions. Um, what what else did I want to say about that? Um, to me, uh, and and I try to um, communicate this with you guys. I've I've put incident scenes that are very um, hard to look at. They they are sort of blurred out. Even so, they're very um, graphic. I have put them on crimerocket2.com, so go and have a look at that. I think I also put more images on Patreon. Um, but you get a very good idea that, that Stephen died on the scene because of the amount of blood that is not only on the scene, but you can see, yeah, I mean, go and have a look at those images. And so if you have some sort of scenario where he was killed somewhere else and brought there, that just doesn't um, seem likely. And don't, don't take my word for it, go and have a look at those pictures and you'll see um, you'll see that. Uh, Wolfie, thanks very much for that, I appreciate it. <laughs> Marlene says, I think it's sad that exhume him, that should have been taken care of eight years ago. I think it's uh, sad, but I also think it's positive. I think You've got a mother here who is um, anxious and concerned and whatever. And, you know, um, this is one way to get closure. So, you know, I, I think without the GoFundMe, she, she couldn't really have reached that point. And this is a way that we can, you know, that society, uh, you know, literally the true crime community um, contributing to uh, the Smith family, and that's allowing a kind of a justice to take place where more, more, more attention is being paid to this case. And as a result of that, um, you know, uh, the chance of justice in, improves, increases. The other thing to note is we've just had the trial of um, Alec Murdoch, and after the after the murders of Paul and Maggie, Sled opened an investigation into the Stephen Smith case. That, that was when it originally was opened. I think it was two weeks later. I think if there was anything to find there, you had the top lawyers investigating links not only to, I think, to Buster, but also to Alex, right? And if there was a link, I think they would have found it. I think they were trying to find anything they could on Alex Murdoch and, and possibly even Buster. And um, I think if they did find something, it would have come out at trial, don't you? Doesn't that make sense? Uh, would be Renaissance lady says, how many of us would ever leave their wallet behind in their car? Uh, well, very late at night, you might. Anyway, let's deal with this article. So it says here there are four or five things that may have happened. Let's go through a couple of them. 
So you have Dr. Kenny Kinsey. He was hired as a forensic crime scene uh, analysis expert to look into the death of 19-year-old Stephen Smith. So the it's the actual, actually, uh, first of all, that this was just a consultant or just some other expert. Wow, Lisa, thank you so much. <laughs> really appreciate that. Uh, happy Easter, Lisa. Thank you. So, yeah, so you've got the actual crime scene reconstructionist in the Stephen Smith case giving his opinion on what's going on here. And he says there are about four or five possibilities. And what is the first one that he mentions? Deb says, have you been sleeping and eating well? Um, I've definitely been eating quite well the last day or so. Sleep, uh, I've been sleeping a little bit in the car. Um, I've had to get up early to do this because I'm going to meet Lisa for breakfast, uh, which is probably in the next half hour. So I really need to wrap this up. So, yeah, I mean, um, I'm trying to kind of uh, catch up. Cassandra says, I love the Van Gogh series so much. Thanks for that. Okay, so let's let's kind of get go through this. Um, so he says, the first thing that he mentions, and I think it means something that he mentions this first, is he says, um, number one is that Stephen Smith was killed elsewhere and dropped in the road. That's the first one that he mentions. And I, I personally think that that is uh, the least likely when you just look at those images. I don't think it takes a rocket science. I don't think it, it's not like I'm a true crime genius when I say that. I think anyone looking at those images would say, yes, you can obviously see he died at the scene, right? Do you agree with that? If you've seen those images, do you agree that that's true? If you haven't seen those images, let me uh, give you a link so that you can. Um, they are they are graphic, but they are also um, blurred out, so you don't have to worry about that. Just trying to find the link for you, just a second. There it is. Joan, thanks for joining us. Kathy and Colette. Thank good to see you here. Khaled says he is. Uh, Wolfie says, I think so too. Okay, so anyway, I'll put the link down there. Um, so it says, number one, Mr. Smith was killed elsewhere and dropped in the road. Number one, I don't think he was killed elsewhere. Um, I don't think he was brought from somewhere else. Um, to be very graphic about it, you wouldn't have that amount of blood uh, there if he was killed somewhere else. It just wouldn't be possible. Um, then he says the other options are that he was killed at the location where he was found, and I, I believe that that's the case. Then he says he could have been struck by a vehicle of someone who knew they struck him, or he could have been struck by a vehicle where the driver did not know. Something could have been put out the window and struck him, or there could have been something hanging off a truck and struck him. All of those are uh, very uh, credible possible scenarios. And bear in mind, the reconstructionist is saying this now in April 2023. So it's not to say that eight years later, it's definitely not, uh, or that the original assessment is definitely incorrect. The original assessment is still a possibility. The question is, is it the likeliest possibility? 
living in the pines is nice to wake up to a lot this morning. Thanks for that. So let's look at the poll. Uh, let's see where we are at the moment. 65% say it's too soon to say what. Um, and then about 35% say either it's hard to say or no, whether this autopsy has changed anything. We would like more clarity. We will see if we get some. Uh, Cassandra said that they published his cell phone records. That's that may be even more illuminating than the autopsy we'll see. Thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah, so make sure you go and have a look at that link. Okay, so let's uh, go through just a couple of other points here. Um, Kinsey says, for such a somber duty, in other words, the second autopsy, it was a success and they collected what they needed to collect. They were able to examine everything they needed to examine. So one wonders whether he's actually spoken to the experts who performed the autopsy. I would imagine he has, and I would imagine they will, and they will continue to consult one another. So another point he makes is he says uh, he's reworking the forensic part just like it's a brand new scene and following up on any kind of leads. And if they're verifiable, then I'm passing them on to the lawyers for the Smith's uh, family, for, for Sandy, <coughs> and uh, also to Sled, right? You see the um, the branding on this bottle. You got to see that Yellowstone. I'll put a couple of photos of Yellowstone in uh, Van Gogh Leathers Fifty One on Team Peachtree. So so head over there if you if you're curious, or uh, go to uh, my Instagram. It's over there. If you want a link to my Instagram, I'll just put that quickly in chat as well. Connie, uh, good morning from East Tennessee. Good to see you here. Thanks very much. Lani says, where else are you going? I know the Velo case is in Idaho. Uh, are you going to, are you in Idaho, Lani? And can you reserve a ticket? Let me know. The bison are amazing. I've taken a couple of pictures. Okay, so let's just finalize this. I need to kind of get going. But he says um, he'd been to the location where Smith's car was discovered as well as the spot where the openly gay teen was found dead. He says, I basically reconstructed it with notes and sketches and photographs and measurements and verified everything, located the exact location where Mr. Smith came to rest. I went to the vehicle and I traveled every possible path from A to B through the woods, walking on the highway, walking on the shoulder of the road, driving on the highway. What I'd like to know is, is he reconstructing it using computer animation? I, I would really be interested in that. Um, Kinsey's working alongside the anthropologist, okay, and the pathologist. He says, hopefully we can fill in a lot of the blanks. He also says that he hopes the publicity will get someone to come forward. So if this was a hit and run all along, then someone has been keeping a secret, possibly been keeping a secret for eight years. Someone who, if someone did knock him over, someone has known that and not said anything for about eight years. Um, you know, someone may have been driving and not known what they did at the time, and when they got home, they, they saw uh, blood spatter or, or, or something on um, on the trailer or vehicle equipment or whatever, and then, you know, didn't say anything. Maybe they weren't a licensed driver, who knows? So anyway, the bottom line is he says here, this isn't going to be a blood spatter case. 
He says, this isn't going to be a footwear case after eight years. He says, it's going to be somebody telling. That's not really a good sign. Not a good sign that the crime scene reconstructionist post-autopsy is saying, we still need somebody to tell us what happened. Do you agree with that? It's not really a very good sign. I'm actually quite dismayed to see that, uh, but, but maybe it's too early to say. You could get a ticket online, okay. Are you going to Boulder? Guys, you're going to have to wait and see. You're going to have to wait and see where I end up going. Um, but I'm going somewhere. I'm actually leaving Montana uh, later today. So the next time you see me, I'm not going to be in Montana. Um <clears throat> I'll give you a clue where I'm going is warmer than Montana. Okay, so let's go on to the Koberger case. And I want to play this clip. Please let me know if the sound, if you can hear the sound. It's quite interesting when you look at the opening sort of uh, <clears throat> opening moments from this clip from Good Morning America. You actually see Stephen Smith was the previous segment. So they're kind of covering the same high-profile cases. You notice that. So let me know if you um, can't hear the sound here. Uh, Kathy, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Now to the University of Idaho murder case, the family of Ethan Chapin, one of the four students killed in an off-campus house last November, is speaking for the first time. Kena Whitworth has the story. Good morning, Kena. Yeah, George, good morning. Jim and Stacey Chapin say they've been receiving supportive messages from people around the world. I went and met them at the Tulip Farm where Ethan spent his summers working to see how they're honoring their son's memory. Pushing through the earth, the yellow and white tulips bearing the name Ethan Smile, meeting the son for the first time. It's just turned into something so special, yeah. something tangible that represents him now. Nearly so there you can see that's obviously early spring in America and uh, they are um, they planted tulips and the tulips are actually starting to come out and to flower and I guess this is a, a new variety that they've developed. It's really a nice gesture. And they are, you know, um, the people who are buying Ethan's smile, uh, that money is going to charity. That money is going to... I wouldn't say charity, but it's going to, I think, um, uh, what do you call them? Bursaries and things like that. Um, yeah, for the truth. Uh, it's a great uh, uh, avatar or name for your avatar. Cool. Thanks very much for that. So, uh, by the way, Cindy, I do actually intend to go to Austin. The Caitlin Armstrong case is there, and I really do want to cover that. And I really like Austin. I'd really like to. So I uh, might see you, Cindy, uh, in in Austin. So definitely is my plan to get to Austin. We'll, we'll see if it happens. Okay. Um, so let's continue with this. Five months ago, the 20-year-old was murdered, along with his girlfriend, Zana Kernodal, and her roommates, Kaylee Gonzalez and Madison Mogan, in that off-campus home at the University of Idaho. It's tough. Tough not have it here. It's just not get up and watch the sunrise and drink your coffee and cry in your coffee. Ethan's parents, Jim and Stacy, speaking out for the first time. And I love to hug him. Yeah, I'd give anything to just be able to hug him. You just always make sure you, you just always hug your kid. Ethan, the eldest of triplets, so full of joy. He spent his last. So that's actually something I haven't seen before. You, you can see that's inside that house in Idaho. Uh, looks like it's kind of in the kitchen area. Have you guys seen that before? Stay on this earth with his siblings. The three seem here at his sister Maisie's sorority formal before spending time with Zana at his Sigma Chi fraternity and then Zana's home 
at 1122 King Street, where they were murdered just hours later. That house set to be demolished. You think stuff like that never happens? You do. You think it happens to other people. But I'm telling you, if it can happen to us, it can happen to anybody. Both Maisie and Hunter are now back at school, preparing to graduate without their brother. Hunter. So what I think really puts into perspective the Idaho case for me is um, the fact that other students have got to go back there and finish their studies. And, you know, if, you, if you've studied at university, I think you know what it can require of you. You know, you need to be able to concentrate, but it also, you want to, they're supposed to be some of the best years of your life and you want them to be the best years of your life, right? And here you have his own siblings. Do they want to be reminded and traumatized, you know, um, kind of unnecessarily? And then you've also got the survivors. Do they want to be reminded? But then you've also got just the ordinary students there. And, and that's kind of, I think, where you want to ask the question, is our business uh, as the true crime community is it doing more harm than good? And, and I think it's quite important to think about that because I think some people speculate in a way that's harmful. And I think some speculate in a way that's helpful. And I, but I just think one's got to think about Moscow as this, you know, Moscow is basically a town that is a student town. And should it be... Um, should Moscow become oh, the place where four students were brutally murdered or should it be Moscow is still Moscow? Do you know what I mean? In other words, should that entire town have like a facelift and like a psychological um, facelift in a sense because of this tragedy or should it be allowed to become what it was to begin with? And it's an important question because if, Koberger committed this crime, but no matter whether it was Koberger or anyone else, whoever committed this crime wanted to destroy people's lives. And so this, this is um, where you ask, well, do you want to allow that to happen? Do you want to allow a trauma to overtake the present and to contaminate the present and to, you know what I mean? And, and the flip side to that is, can you contain that, that process, that destructive process? Thanks a lot, Joan. Uh, uh, Christina says, Moscow is still Moscow. I was there two weeks ago visiting my daughter. That's good to hear. Jalski says, I hope everything gets back to normal. A. Konzel says, I think it should be allowed to be what it was. Koberger doesn't deserve this power. And so I think a great gesture would be to, to try and somehow turn whatever has happened into something else. And the, the idea of creating a garden, and, and yeah, you actually have the same thing happening somewhere else with Ethan's family. Nature and, and gardens are always very soothing um, and uplifting. And you know, I was in a, one of the most spectacular gardens, if you want to call it that, in America, Yellowstone forest as far as the eye can see um, and it's, it's all very um, humbling soothing uplifting uh, exciting wonderful and so um, that's one way of sort of dealing with this that's why i would also prefer the house where the crime happened transform the house don't demolish the house um, turn it into a, another place where happy memories can be made. Um, that's my personal opinion. I know it's not going to happen, but that's my personal opinion. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, let's continue. He was kind of Ethan's wingman. I mean, you realize when you're a triplet, you have spent your whole life together, the three of them. Stacy and Jim lean on each other in what they're calling a shuddersome year of firsts, doing things they've always done, but for the first time without Ethan. 
preparing for milestones. The one we have coming up first, 21st birthday. That's going to be We tough have one. talked about the kids' 21st birthday <laughs> forever. Yeah. And that's going to be tricky. Yeah, that is going to be a tricky time. Yep. Here at Tulip Valley Farms, Ethan worked in the fields planting bulbs, and now he's being remembered with his own. Ethan's. What a beautiful image that. Um, look at the sunrise in the background. Let's try and get back to it. With his own. What a what a beautiful image. Okay, and that then brings us to sort of the next um, thing I want to deal with in this story. And uh, it's to do with the idea of one of the victims found, um, apparently found, I actually don't know whether all of these news stories are accurate. I mean, they're all from anonymous sources, so do we know that for sure? Um, Connie says... Your intelligence is very attractive. Thanks very much. Connie, uh, happy Easter. Hope you have a wonderful weekend. Thanks so much. So um, so I, I think uh, th this raises a couple of questions. One is whose ID was found? And I, I, think, I think it's likely that it was Maddie's. We don't know that for sure. But you, you never know. He may have seen one of the IDs of the victims lying around in the house and taken one of them. But uh, one kind of has the idea that it might have been Maddie's, right? Um, and that kind of makes you think a little bit again of Jeffrey Dahmer. He also kept mementos and or souvenirs. And why do they do that? Well, I think it's because they want to feel a connection to you know, like, look at that that headline. ID connected to Idaho murder victim found in Brian Koberger's car, right? So in the same way that that connects, theoretically, may connect Koberger to the crime, you kind of get the idea that Koberger wanted, wanted a connection with one of the victims. And I, what I mean is when she was alive, he wanted to, he reached out to her. Um, he wanted to, thanks a lot for that, Sharon. He wanted to have a connection. Why does he want a connection? Because he's lonely, because he's disconnected, because he's fragmented. And all of that we know is true based on Teachergate and everything else, right? We know that he was socially awkward. We know that he had white, uh, you know, the, um, what do they call it? What is it called? White noise. No, not white noise, white snow. Is that what it was called? Um, and that kind of made him feel, uh, you know, um, more anxious than most other people do when he was at, at that age, when he was a teenager, right? Sarah says, I'm hesitant to believe the ID news, but if it's true. Yeah, so, I mean, um, I'm also a bit hesitant, but that would be kind of like a smoking gun on top of the DNA, right? Visual static, visual snow. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I must say, to me, as more and more information comes out, Koberger, if he's the person who committed this, he seems to be less and less like the perfect master criminal, right? Visual snow syndrome, that's right. So what else is there to say here? So first of all, whose ID was it? Was it Maddie's? Um, secondly, how dumb can if this is true? How dumb can you be that you 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 know like if you think about the story that we know so far, this idea that he was taking out, you know, after Christmas at his parents' home, that he was taking out the trash that he was wearing those gloves, right? And he was, you know what I mean? Even in his own apartment in um, uh, Washington, Washington State, right? Um, Pullman, this idea that he may have 
vacuumed and cleaned and wiped things away. You go to all of that effort. And meanwhile, you've got the person's ID in your glove compartment. And who knows, maybe he had it in his glove compartment at those police stops, right? You know, it's not, not um, the kind of slick, um, smooth criminal that um, people thought he was right in the beginning, is he, right? So that, that was the other thing I wanted to bring to your attention. Um, again, I'm not sure what to make of all of these uh, scoops and, you know, anonymous sources. I'm not quite sure what to make of it. But anyway, there you go. Then the, the very last thing I want to bring up, I really need to go, it's almost 10 to 9, um, is this story about Kay, Kay Woodcock. Larry, uh, JJ, uh, Ryan's, um, have I got that right? JJ Ryan's grandfather may not uh, attend trial. Any of you know why that is? Let's, let's see how well you understand the law. Do you know why Larry is not allowed to attend the trial? I, I think Ted Bundy was smarter than most yeah it should be also an interesting case it should be an interesting case i believe it is found in his vehicle right so if i if you look at this article it says found in brian koberger's car during search six weeks after quadruple killings. So that's my, the information I've got. Um, so I, I'm not, not sure where you got your information. There you go. Well done, Joe. That's, that's the reason, plain and simple, the reason that uh, Larry can't uh, basically, a ten trial is 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 a witness, and and that can that can affect his testimony. Simple as that. Simple as that. So let's just have a quick look at what uh, news nations say about this. Uh, before we do, I can't get over this picture of Lori Vello. Um, she she looks so she looks crazy. Um, you know, her her lips are pursed, her eyes are extremely piercing. Uh, she got like a permanent frown. Um, that's not the Lori Bello of um, you know the when she was kind of on Wheel of Fortune or um becoming, you know, um, not a beauty queen, but she was in the running for some kind of beauty pageant. Yes, she looks uh, very disturbed, doesn't she? Um, I agree, it looks bitter, looks bitter. I mean, she looks like a tortured soul, doesn't she? I mean, um, how else, if you think about Lori Bello and Letitia Stork, I wrote a book on Letitia Stork, and you know it's obviously incredibly heinous to for a guardian to kill their own child. And obviously, it's innocent or proven guilty, but it looks like um, uh, Letitia may have done something horrible. But so much more so with Lori Vello, she's she's being accused of being, I guess, indirectly involved in the murders of not one child, but two. Plus there's a ex-husband who's dead. Plus there's a wife who's died, Chad's wife. Plus there's also a, bro a brother. You know, it's, is it now one, two, three, four, five or more murders? But I'm just saying, um, if you just take the Letitia Stork case, it's, it's kind of, Bad enough, just killing one child. Now you've got two children plus someone else plus someone else. What kind of person does that? How does someone get to that point? And I think there's some intertextuality with the Murdoch case is that 
there's some kind of sickness that, that gets worse and worse. It's some kind of psychological uh, sick way of thinking. In, in Murdo's case, it was greed and fraud and all that, and, and that then leads to you know the way that you treat money and uh, um, clients and friends and family then leads to becoming increasingly careless with other people's lives. Well, I think it's something similar, but it's 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 um, maybe uh, greed for power. I think is a is a bigger thing. So in the Murdoch case, I believe the motive is greed. There is a power aspect to it. I think in the Lori Vallow case, I think the motive is power, but not power in a conventional sense. It's kind of spiritual powers, power, social power over others. Um, you know. Um, and it's also a greed for power, but it's very much someone who's powerless and helpless who wants to become like a god. Think about if you want to become god or a god or the god or whatever, what else are you wanting to do other than assert power, be powerful? And um, I read something incredibly disturbing that Lori Vallow had apparently said or yeah, I think she'd said something like, or she'd heard something like that her children were cockroaches and they were what? So something really disgusting. So, something that her children were cockroaches and they were, let me get the exact quote. Something about a parasite. And so she was doing them a favor by, yeah, so she said, Lori believed her children were cockroaches controlled by a parasite. And so she was doing a favor by ending their lives. I mean, you've got to be totally, like, where where's your thought process gone in order to think that way? Okay, so I'm going to play this quick clip from uh, News Nation. With the volume. This nation's senior national correspondent, Brian Enton. And uh, Brian, I understand, I mean, they've got it down. They're almost close when it comes to the jury pool, right? They might finish today. They are, Elizabeth. I feel like I tell you that every day, though, that they're getting very, very, very close. But today they actually are. Uh, they just need to get about three more jurors to get to the number 42, and then each side will get to strike 12 jurors. Then they'll be down to 18, which is what they need, 12 jurors and six alternates. So that is either going to happen within the next hour or so. They're still working very, very hard behind me in the courthouse. Uh, if they don't finish it totally today, they'll come back tomorrow morning for a couple of hours, uh, and then opening statements will begin on Monday. And the judge did make a pretty key ruling today, allowing the grandparents of the children, the murdered children, to remain in the courtroom, along with their older brother and a couple of other family members. I know that Lori, Lori's Vallow's legal team really fought that. Can you explain why? Yeah, they didn't think that they needed to be uh, in the, the courtroom for the entire trial because they are also witnesses. It's sort of a tricky situation because not only are they, they victims with, with this whole entire thing, but, but they're also witnesses in the trial. So her legal team. Yeah, so that is exactly what we were saying earlier on. Okay, guys, so that is my update just on some of the main cases that we are dealing with at the moment. Uh, I must say... Well, when I, whenever I've been in South Africa, I've sort of felt like um, I want to do what Brian Anton's doing. I want to be where Brian Anton is. So let's see if that ultimately happens. Let's let's uh, let's wait and see. Okay, guys. So uh, cheers from uh, very cold Big Sky, Montana. As I say, I'll be putting up some more uh, videos on um, my journey so far on the Team Peachtree channel. I've already have put some over there, so check it out. Um, I'm going to be somewhere else by tonight, um, and I'll probably be back online um, tomorrow the next day. So I will start to uh, do more regular TCRS content in the coming week, so look out for that. Um, I'll be 
doing, I guess, a couple more. I don't really like doing lives, but I'll be doing relatively more lives than I normally do. And then um, the edited videos will start coming online more regularly, probably uh, probably um, um, from the end of next week onwards. So, so keep your eyes peeled for that. Uh, let's go through the last couple of comments from you guys, and then I'm going to skedaddle. Um, enjoy your time. Thanks, Christina. Yeah, definitely. There's some intertextuality between the Laurie Vallow case and the Murdoch case. Do you see that? Except you kind of have a, a woman that is um, pulling strings and exerting power in the one, whereas there's a man in the other. James says, I love thinkers. God bless all of you. Thanks, James. Okay. Alice of Legend. <laughs> Wolfie says, I hope the rest of your visit is awesome. We love you in the States. Cool. I'm looking forward to meeting some of you. Um, when I'm where I'm going to be next, I'll uh, reach out and see who's in the area, and we'll see if anyone is. So. Thanks a lot, Where the Wind Blows. Um, Laysa, thank you. Um, have a great Easter, all of you. I hope you're going to have good weather. And obviously, Easter is a sign that things are going to be warming up and that life is going to be coming back to this part of the world. And um, I mean, I've come out of a South African summer and I'm looking forward to warmer weather as well. I'm looking forward to going through the American summer as well with you guys, spring and summer. So we'll see. Um, Sharon, thanks a lot for moderating. We, we miss Stephanie, but I think she's dealing with her son's got something going on, some robotics thing. So, um, yeah. Um, far out aliens. Thank you so much. Very kind of you. And so on that note from Jelsey and Lisa, happy Easter, guys. Uh, Stephanie said, I really enjoyed that live stream. That's good to hear. Makes me feel encouraged to do another one. So thanks a lot for that. Take care, guys. Uh, keep it real. And I'll see you guys next time from Any Ideas Where? <laughs> well, watch this space. Okay. I'm out of here.